Okay, good morning, everybody. We have new rules, um, and the new rules have implications for those of us who do human research, and there are more hoops that we have to jump through, and it's a little bit of an arcane system. And so we are extremely fortunate to have with us Dr. Steve Grant, um, who is a senior pro he is the senior program official at the National Institute on Drug Abuse on Translational Neuroscience Research. And uh, before he starts talking to us about human research, regulations, what's considered a clinical trial, and all of these things that we have to understand, I just want to say a few things about who Steve is. Um, he's had an amazing impact on uh, addiction research primarily, but cognitive neuroscience research in general. He's one of these extremely unusual people who has a background where he's done translational research from salamanders to non-human primates and human research. He's worked in every possible way that can impact the field. Um, he worked as a basic researcher where he made tremendous contributions. For example, he did the first study of, um, <laughs> of imaging. Do we need? No, I'm fine. Uh, of imaging uh, Q induced craving, which kind of set a lot of people working in a certain area. He did the first studies of decision making deficits and addiction. Um, in addition to doing his own basic research, he's taught graduate students at the master's and PhD level. He uh, worked as a federal employee at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, not only in basic research in the laboratory, but also as a senior program official at NIDA, being a branch chief for 11 years. And I believe that he was the singularly uh, most influential program officer and branch chief influencing the direction of the field and helping young scientists all across the country get their own stuff started. So it's, it was also in my life a pleasure to work with Steve for part of this time. And so we're really happy that you're here and thank you so much for helping us. For Great. It's my pleasure. So thank you, Edie, for that wonderful introduction. And I have to say that some of the advances that she mentioned was because I worked in Edie's lab when I was at the um, National Institute of um, Drug Abuse Intramural Research Program. And it was because of Edie's leadership and openness to new directions that we were able to accomplish what we did. As you also saw, I'm a klutz. And I spilled you know, coffee on me, so uh, I may be brushing off my clothes a little bit. And please excuse me. Okay, so what's going on at NIH? Well, when I first started to put this uh, talk together, I thought I would have to say, open up by saying, don't kill the messenger. I'm just telling you things. These are not my decisions. These are not my rules. But then last week, um, Dr. Mike Lauer, who is the Deputy Director of all extramural research at NIH, spoke at the NIDA intramural, I mean the NIDA um, National Advisory Council meeting. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and in the middle of his talk, he got a question from a council member that showed that he had reversed or the policy had been greatly changed and then last Friday they issued a new set of case studies so I had to rework my talk um, and decided in the end to go with the standard set of slides that um, NIH has put together so all this presentation and the case studies are all publicly available at the NIH um, website on clinical trials policy. So you don't have to be scribbling down things uh, a whole lot. Plus, I'll leave the presentation here. 
this morning I woke up and found out too late that Mike Lauer was speaking at the NIMH um, National Advisory Council. So there may be further changes. This is a somewhat fluid situation and we can expect changes not only up in continuously now but probably for the next year and a half. There's going to be tweaks and modifications and clarifications and that's going to um, hopefully be rolled out in enough time for people to adjust their applications but we recognize that this is a fluid situation and I want to start out by saying there's going to be leniency on the, pol on the enforcement and the policy while everything is being shaken out. We're not going to, we're not planning on um, returning applications without review or not giving applicants a chance to modify their applications after review to fit whatever regulatory um, strictures that they need to deal with. So these are the areas that, have, that are affected by the new clinical trials policy. And some of these I'm going to go over fairly quick because we have a limited amount of time because I want to concentrate on the case studies which are the most controversial part. So everybody's going to need good clinical practice training. If you're doing a clinical trial, all staff have to be certified in good clinical practice training. I imagine there may already be a, a course for that here. Um, it'll just now apply to a wider scope of people. If you're doing multi-site trials, then there's a uh, requirement to use a single IRB, which hopefully will speed up the process. Registration and reporting in clinicaltrials.gov is going to be beefed up. Program officers are going to be monitoring entries into clinicaltrials.gov. It's going to be audited more frequently because this is where the problem arose in the first place. People were not keeping up with the reporting requirements for clinicaltrials.gov. There will be new review criteria for studies that are classified as clinical trials. There will be every um, program announcement, funding opportunity announcements, or FOAs, is going to, are going to be rescinded and reissued because there's new forms and new instructions for the forms for to adhere with the clinical trials policy. So there's going to be a lot of changes around these different areas. Okay, here are the reasons why we're going through the reforms or the um, changes in policy and it's the same thing you always hear is efficiency, transparency, accountability, timely reporting. Because people were not doing these things. And there was an article in the British Medical Journal a number of years ago showing that of the studies in clinicaltrials.gov, about 50% of those studies that were registered never published anything. So where did the data go? What happened with that? Records weren't being kept up. Um, the public was complaining because they'd go on clinicaltrials.gov and look for something that was relevant to them and find out that the protocol had been terminated three years ago and nobody updated the record. Nobody closed it out. Or the results were not put up on clinicaltrials.gov. And then we did our own internal audit, found the same thing, everybody was appalled. And so last as of January of 2017, a new policy went into effect to increase the stewardship of clinical trials. And that's where this is all coming from. Okay, so there's new forms in the application. As I said, the single IRB, training in good practice. Uh, funding announcements are now going to say in their title whether they are clinical, they will accept clinical trials or they will not accept clinical trials. So right in the title of FOA it will say clinical trials only or no clinical trials allowed. Um, 
there will be new review uh, criteria, particularly criteria relating to the different types of clinical trials. And as I said, more reporting requirements for clinicaltrials.gov. Okay, how does NIH define a clinical trial? This is where the most controversy has been. This definition was released by NIH in 2014 without any controversy because everybody kind of knew what a clinical trial was. So human subjects, prospective assignment, interventions, and a health-related biomedical or behavioral outcome. Pretty straightforward, not a big, not a big issue. So those people who do clinical trials, you know, this, this is a clinical trial. The problem came, one of the problems that came about is there were studies being conducted and funded that met the, these requirements but were not being classified as a clinical trial and not being um, registered in clinicaltrials.gov on the basis of we're only going to do this in five subjects. We have this new cancer drug, we're only going to do this in five subjects. It's a pilot study. It's not really a clinical trial. We're using this drug to treat anxiety, but it's already an approved drug, and we're just looking to see the mechanism for it in humans. That's not a, the, the assumption was, oh, that's not a clinical trial. Even though you may be looking at anxiety ratings, a health-related biomedical outcome. And as people went through and parsed this definition more closely, even though this definition in 2014 when it was released, there was an explicit statement saying there was not an intention to expand the scope of clinical trials. That we were not intending that this definition would lead to studies being classified as a clinical trial that not, had not previously been considered a clinical trial. Now, currently, the new NIH policy explicitly says we are expanding the scope of what is considered a clinical trial. That's where most of the controversy has been. And it has revolved primarily around the issue of what is an intervention. So, unpacking the definition, prospective assignment, virtually any experimental study uses prospective assignment. It doesn't have to be randomized assignment. The only things that are not prospectively assigned generally are epidemiological and observational studies. So, anything that is experimental or laboratory based will largely will meet this criteria of prospective assignment. Anything that is a an actual treatment clinical trial will meet this requirement because either you have randomization to groups or randomization of order or something along those lines and that's prospective assignment. Interventions. This is the definition. A manipulation of the subject's environment for the purpose of modifying one or more health-related biomedical or behavioral processes. This is where the expansion occurred in terms of what represents an intervention. Now, the examples that are given here, and this is the standard NIH official slide set. So these exam examples, I don't think anybody would have much concern about these things being interventions. One might be the, the second to last. This is strategies to change health related behavior. So behavior is considered a health related outcome. And that's a little bit broader than it had been previously where people thought of interventions as drugs, procedures, or devices. In the addiction field, this is less of a concern in the mental health field because we've always considered behavior, behavioral interventions. Um, treatment strategies, prevention strategies, diagnostic procedures, all of this would represent an intervention of some sort or another. Health-related biomedical or behavioral outcomes. The broadest interpretation I've heard to date is 
if it if the study is funded by NIH, it is by definition including a health related biomedical behavioral outcomes because that is the mission of NIH and we wouldn't be funding it otherwise. We wouldn't be funding a human study otherwise unless it related to a biomedical behavioral outcome. But then again, we're going, these examples look fairly clear. But as we'll get into the case studies, we're going to see the devil is in the detail and there's a very broad gray area especially in the neuroscience field. Okay, so NIH definition has explicitly been broadened. Um, it is a little bit, this slide, I don't agree. Just say my personal opinion, my humble opinion, that the, the definition was not broadened in October 2014. It was explicitly not broadened. But the current line is, it was broadened back in 2014 and nobody complained, so what's the problem here? Um, the, the two things I want to point out are there you go. Mechanistic clinical trials, exploratory developmental studies, and pilot feasibility studies, which previously people may have decided when they put in their application to say this is not a clinical trial. These will now be considered clinical trials if they meet the four criteria I outlined below. So many more studies are going to be now classified as clinical trials. And this is now, this is what I want to focus on. How do you determine whether your study is a clinical trial? So, four questions. Why is your study different from all other studies, or the same as all other studies? It involves human subjects. Okay, that's not a problem. That, that's not controversial. Prospective assignments, probably not controversial or a problem. There may be some gray area in terms of um, a large-scale survey or uh, observational study. Evaluate the effects of an intervention. Okay, that, seem, that seems very straightforward as well, but we're going to see that is where there's a lot of room for interpretation, as is the health-related biomedical or behavioral outcome. There will be a checklist in the new application forms that you will have to fill out. And in order to proceed with an application form for a clinical trial funding announcement, you have to answer yes to all four questions. Otherwise, you will not be able to proceed with that form and you will be directed to the non-clinical trials form. Is that clear? Okay. So, case studies. These are publicly available case studies at this website. If you're going to copy down anything, just the first part of this. Once you get to the clinical trials page, there will be linked to case studies, FAQs, sample application forms, other things, including this presentation. Okay, this was the crux of the controversy that led to articles in Science and Nature, and there's a petition circulating. And it's, this is now officially retracted and outdated. But to give you context to the current case studies, I want to go through this first. So this is a study, an MRI study in healthy subjects where they do a working memory task. Everybody familiar with a working memory task? FMRI, what that entails? Okay. Does this study involve human subjects? Yes. No problem there. Are the subjects prospectively assigned to an intervention? Yes. The participants are assigned to an intervention, the working memory task. Is it designed to evaluate the effect of the intervention on the participants? Yes, because you're going to be measuring brain activity. So you're acting, asking the participants to do something. You are intervening with their normal behavior. And then you're measuring a, a um, brain activity. You're measuring a physiological activity 
And that physiological activity, brain at function, is a health-related outcome. So a lot of things that are considered fundamental research, basic research, mechanistic research, under this case study would be considered a clinical trial. And this is where the pushback came. Initially, we were told back in the summer, don't argue, just do it. The time, there was a public comment period about a year and a half ago. The, you know, all comments, every possible comment that you could bring up in this room came up in the public comment period. The concerns were heard and a decision was made that was approved by Francis Collins and as Larry Tabak, the, the, direct, the deputy director for extramural research said, the time for litigation is over. Well, this came to as a surprise even to the various um, NIH Institute directors, particularly those involved in um, neuroscience and brain research. They found this, as you probably do, to be overly broad and problematic. But they were told it's a done deal. But I think people kept complaining. And I can't think the IC directors, particularly the Brain Institute IC directors, but others as well, pushed back. And that's why we were all walking out of last week's meeting with Mike Lauer, rubbing our necks because we were suffering from whiplash. It just dropped with no warning. So here are the new case studies. This, this study is essentially the um, NIDA-led ABCD study, which is longitudinally tracking s subjects, um, nine uh, children for 10 years, doing brain scans, under the old case study, this would have had to be reclassified as a clinical trial. And everybody who is enrolled, and there's 5,000 subjects enrolled so far, would have had to be reconsented. So you can see this is an enormous logistical issue. Does the study involve human participants? Yes. Are they prospectively assigned to an intervention? No. In this case, the reformulation and reinterpretation is having them do tasks, either cognitive tasks, tasks in the scanner, measuring brain activity is observational, not an intervention. Because you're, there's no intention to change those behaviors or change the brain activity. Is that clear? Okay. So. The ABCD study is not a clinical trial. And the old case 18 that I just showed you, that kind of study is not a clinical trial. Okay, 18B. Here we're doing the same type of study and we are administering standard um, cognitive tasks to look at, and we're comparing a disease population, a patient population to healthy controls. Are human subjects, yes. Is this, um, are they prospectively assigned to an intervention? No, because these are cognitive tasks and MRI that are not intended to change the disease state or change behavior. They're merely observational. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, any questions so far? Okay. But, the next case, I've got these slightly out of order. Um, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, here we have healthy volunteers who are randomly assigned to two conditions, two different conditions. And, and it actually doesn't matter whether it's a within subject design or a um, cross-sectional design. To a, to a condition to enhance or interfere with cognitive performance. And these are going to be measured um, both behaviorally 
and with fMRI. Human subjects, yes. Intervention, yes. Because the experimental condition, the independent variable, is intended to change the underlying behavior and underlying brain function. So there's an intervention, yes. The prospective assignment, yes. Is there a health-related behavioral outcome? Yes, because cognitive performance and brain function are health-related biomedical behavioral outcomes. This is a clinical trial. How many people in the room seeing this will now have studies that are classified as clinical trials? Okay, so already you can see the impact of this this change. Why is the up arrow not working? There we go. Okay, another study, another case, healthy volunteers. They're randomly assigned. In this case, they're going to go into one or two different MRI setups. You look puzzled. No, I remember reading this one on the internet, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So they're going to go on to two uh, different MRI setups. One is real, one is a mock scanner. And the intention of this study, the goal of this study is to find out whether exposure to the magnetic fields that are present in an MRI scanner changes, that alone changes behavior and um, of course not, we can't measure brain function because one of them is a mock scanner. Is it human subjects? Yes. Are they prospectively assigned to an intervention? Yes. So notice that using a healthy volunteer or disease population is not a part of the criteria for human subjects. It's just plain human subjects. Is the study of, uh, designed to evaluate the effect of the intervention? Yes, because you're asking whether exposure to magnetic fields in a scanner changes um, cognitive performance, memory, in this case memory performance. Is it a health or health-related biomedical behavioral outcome? Yes, memory is a biomedical, health-related biomedical outcome. As you see, anything you would put into NIH that involves humans is likely, almost certainly, going to be considered a health-related biomedical outcome. Okay, so why is it important to work through these case studies? And by the way, there's about 32 case studies. These are not the only ones. Um, so you ap apply using the right funding announcement because there will be clinical trials only and no clinical trials allowed. That your research strategy and human subject portions are written in the proper way, include the proper kinds of information, and as we'll see, are in the proper place in the new application forms. And that you apply with the appropriate policies and regulations. In this case, it's pr primarily um, registration on clinicaltrials.gov. Okay, so at the website I mentioned, clini clinical-trials, yes? Just a quick question. The more narrow definition um, really had to do with this um, understanding that patients were coming to us uh, for treatment and there was the treatment-seeking distinction. Oftentimes in behavioral pharmacology, you have non-treatment. Yeah, yeah, yes. So the more obvious case was someone is coming in and we have like an agreed understanding that this is an intervention to improve your drinking or your, you know, methamphetamine use, right? Mm -hmm. And, and there's that narrow, um, you know, umbrella, the intervention was something that was worked out between sort of you and someone coming to mm -hmm. study maybe through clinical trials like that, where people find those studies. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these studies, one of the distinctions is that these interventions happen, but they're not 
sort of agreed upon or part of the impetus for participation. You know, it's more of an experimental rather than a treatment contract type of intervention, right? Um, so I was wondering if how much that kind of plays into... A lot. There does not have to be a therapeutic treatment. That is not the criteria. The criteria is that you, are, you have an intervention that is intended to change a health-related behavioral outcome. And as, you saw, as you've seen in these case studies, memory performance is a health-related behavioral outcome. Whether or not you have impairments, whether or not you um, are in a patient population or a healthy control, the difference is whether you intend to change memory performance or you are simply assessing and observing memory performance. <laughs> okay, let's go. That's why we're, we have, we're going to have a period of leniency <laughs> as this all gets shaped, as, <laughs> as we learn how to frame and um, as reviewers and study sections get used to the new procedures and this new approach. Let me emphasize both in terms of your question and the prior question that mechanistic studies that meet the criteria are clinical trials, whether there's any therapeutic intent or not. Yes? So in, in trying to grapple with this distinction between the, the change and the observation, what makes the ABCD study not a clinical trial is that every subject gets the same battery of, of tests. It seems like once you do anything where you divide your subjects into two or more groups, one subject gets that would that another subject gets a slightly different version. It can also be within subject. It can be within, it can be within subject, but the ABCD study has no manipulation to change any of the measures. But many of the tasks within it manipulate sort of um, memory load or go no go. I mean, there's yes, and that is that was the basis for the old case 18 that is now rescinded. Yeah. That was the major change in the revision of the policy, was that simply doing a task and observing the result was no longer considered an intervention. So if my working memory task has two conditions, one condition involves distraction, auditory distractions, and another doesn't, is that, is that a change? Well, let me ask you the question, is, auditory dis is the auditory distractor intended to change or hypothesized to change working memory performance in an instantaneous sense it will change their performance on that task then it's that then it's an intervention but every cognitive task i feel has different conditions that are expected yes to increase reaction times or yes increase if you if you intend to do an experimental manipulation that is going to change the performance, whether it's within subject or between subjects, that satisfies the criteria for intervention. And as you saw, behavior, cognitive performance, they're health-related outcomes as far as NIH is concerned. So what you're proposing might be considered a mechanistic clinical trial. Yes? So that would not be an intervention because you're not intending to change inflammation. The tracer is, not inten is intended to measure 
to observe the amount of inflammation. Now, if you had some other manipulation where you gave people um, uh, an NSAID on the basis of saying, does the, is the tracer um, sensitive to changes in inflammation, then it's a clinical trial, even though you're using an over-the-counter drug. Yes? On, I'm sorry, on what? On the menstrual cycle. Yes. So that's something that changes, but I'm not changing it. You're not changing it. So I'm just observing it. You're just observing it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the same, same thing for sleep cycles. On the other hand, if you had people live together, women live together, to test the hypothesis about synchronization, then you are changing it. You're doing a manipulation that is intended or hypothesized to change. Yes? What about um, if Nicole wants to study oral contraceptives? Yes. And she's not introducing oral contraceptives to a group, but she's studying two different groups. One group that takes oral contraceptives, so there's an intervention that they normally do, but she's not doing it, and the other group doesn't take the oral contraceptives, and she's just comparing the groups. So these, the, there may be an explicit case study on on something like that. I can't pull, pull it up right now and I don't remember the number of it. But I, I think this is one of those things that's going to fall in the gray area that is going to have to shake out. So the argument on one side would be you are not prospectively assigning them to taking contraceptives. On the other hand, you are recruiting them and selected them on the basis of their use of contraceptives. And you're not looking to change their contraceptive use or the efficacy of their contraceptive use. So the argument could be made this is an observational study. If, so if I understand if I if I recruit women and then assign them to use <coughs> oral contraceptive or placebo, that's definitely a clinical trial. Yes. If I recruit women who are already taking oral contraceptives and ask them to change nothing, Yes. That is, that is the way I personally would interpret it. Um, but every program officer is struggling to work through these kinds of problems and the study sections will as well. So as I said, there will be a period of leniency where your application may go in as not a clinical trial. It gets a great score. It's going to be considered for funding and we're telling, and then the program officer tells you, we are considering this a clinical trial and so you've got to provide your JIT information for all the sections that are not in the original application. Yes? So what's your sense of how the study sections are equipped to handle this ambiguity? And, and a follow-up to that would be, if we don't agree with how they handled it, what are our options as recipients of their uh, declarations? You've, lit, you've hit the limits of my knowledge. <laughs> right. I, and all I can say is, we'll see. I have not been informed of how reviewers are going to be trained. And in fact, the review criteria are still, the wording of the review criteria for the different types of clinical trials is still in flux. And I had a slide that stated what the review criteria were, and then on Monday I had to remove it because I was informed that the wording is changing. And what will be your options? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Until we start working through actual cases I mean, actual applications. And I suspect every institute will be different. Follow-up to that would then be, to whom might we connect if we get trapped in this uh, uh, chasm? You're Who? always, always the program officer. Okay, but even the program officers have given us, um, shall we say, mixed stories. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't know what else to tell you. 
we are struggling to understand this ourselves. And yes, you're going to get mixed stories and different institutes are going to have slightly different implementations and how we're going and how CSR is going to deal with this in study sections. Basically, we're going to have to wait to the spring, the spring reviews to see when applications come in with the new forms, how this is managed. Yes? What about applications like right now, though, that are in this limbo area trying to, uh, I guess, reconcile between what the investigator thinks is the definition of their application, potentially how it was reviewed and deemed, and that program officer doesn't know how to make the distinction. I mean, what happens right now that there's I had it, okay, so the regulatory requirements, apart from the forms, but the regulatory requirements to make sure that you have um, good clinical trials practice training, that you register on um, clinicaltrials.gov, that program officers are to monitor clinicaltrials.gov more rigorously than we haven't have in the past. It's now our responsibility to provide oversight. All went into effect last January. Right now the forms have a simple check mark on the face page that says, is this a clinical trial? And it is self-identified. I personally have had a couple of cases where post-review a determination was made that it was a clinical trial and we requested additional documentation prior to funding and told the investigator that the, the study would need to be um, registered on clinicaltrials.gov. What if you were asked that the application be withdrawn because it's not eligible for the funding announcement and then Well, right now we are still working okay. on the funding announcements that have existed for many years and that do not make a distinction about clinical trials, unless the funding, uh, funding announcement was specifically for clinical trials. So you don't get to ask these four questions. It's investigator initiated of whether things are a clinical trial or not. And the approach that different ICs and individual program officers and their supervisors varies. So some people are saying, let well enough alone. The investigator knows what they're doing. They didn't call this a clinical trial. And, they did, and at the time of application, they didn't have these case studies to guide them. So we're not going to raise a ruckus about this. We're not going to change it. On the other hand, it might be that, no, this is clearly a clinical trial and it needs to be registered and there's actually a therapeutic intent um, even though the, it's not framed as a therapeutic intent, there is a therapeutic intent, so we do want it to be a clinical trial. Okay, does that answer your question? Well, I, after this meeting, I have a phone conversation with the program officer, so anything I learned here, I'm going to try to share with him, because I'm asking him the same questions that he's asking me questions that we both in a spin cycle. We don't know the answers to it. Right. And that's being rather frustrating. So there's an old joke what is the scientist's favorite plant? The hedge. So, I've got a hedge here. Yes? Do you know what will happen to studies that are kind of in between, so they got submitted without the case scenarios, but might be resubmitted after these came out? Any application submitted after January 25th, 2018, must use the new forms and must answer the four criterion questions. Including resubmissions. Including resubmissions. Yep. However, however, non-competitive renewals, top um, type fives of already funded grants will not be required to adhere to the new policy. Um, it, but when you come in for a competitive renewal, a type two application or a new application, you must adhere to the new policy. So there's a certain amount of grandfathering or grandmothering in this process. Yes? Um, 
many proposals have a number of different specific aims. What if it's just the case that specific aim 4C involves something that would be clinical trial ask and, and warrant the designation, but the rest of it is all just observational? Let me give, give you a, a further example. What if you have mixed animal human? Yeah. The current, this is something that's very much in flux because at one time the idea was we were going to have clinical trials only, absolutely no clinical trials, and a third category that would be called hybrid or clinical trials optional. That third option has come and gone and come back again. So all I can say is check the web pages because this is, this is still something that is in flux, how to handle exactly those kinds of applications. But the, exam the personal example I had to deal with was exactly that. It was study 11, experiment 11 part C that only involved 12 subjects out of a much larger cohort. But in April, when we discussed this, the determination is a clinical trial and that makes the whole study a clinical trial. Or at least that the person had to regis register that part of the, the part of the study that was a clinical trial on clinicaltrials.gov. Any other questions? Yes? You said that there's this good clinical practice training component, but that's something at UCLA might cover it. Yes? Is there, I guess someone here know what that is? Laura? Dr. Ray? No, she left. Oh, she left. Um, anybody in here doing clinical trials already? Okay, well then it'll be, instead of being elective, it'll be mandatory if you're engaged in a clinical trial. So just like you have to go through human subjects training and provide documentation that you've completed the training, same thing. And all your staff. And all your staff, everybody involved in the study. And all the program officers have had to take this as well. Yes. Yes, because they're on the front lines. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but from my experience on study sessions, I would imagine that this would go into the area of uh, not affecting the score, but going into whether or not there are human subjects concerns. And if somebody, if it's not labeled as a clinical trial, but yet, in fact, this happened at a recent study session that I was at, but the study section thought it was a clinical trial. It just gets indicated that there's a concern, what the concern is, and then if the score is a really good score, the program officer worries about it with a potential grantee. So that's very rational, <laughs> and I hope it's the case. You might very well think that, but I couldn't possibly comment. Yeah, go ahead. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Half a step ago you mentioned an April meeting in which everything is going to be resolved or some things are going to be no. resolved or only the mixed study hybrid. No, no. Um, either I misspoke or I wasn't clear. I may have misheard. Yeah. After January 25th, that is for the regular February, March receipt dates, you must use the new forms. Those applications will go, will be reviewed in the spring, in the spring study sections. That is the first time reviewers will be confronted with these new forms, the decision tree, um, and the, you know, we'll, they'll be face to face with this issue. The study, the reviews coming up now in the fall and the reviews that will happen in the winter, they're still going to be using the old forms, but the policy applies. So there's going to be a lot of ambiguity there about how, they're, how they might handle it. And I have received no instructions or no information about how that's going to be done.
or what instructions are going to be given to the reviewers. If any of you are sitting on study section and get instructions for the fall or winter review cycles, let me know because <laughs> they're not telling me and that's because program and review at NIH system has a firewall. Yes? Insofar of clinicaltrials.gov registration, and that was always murky too. Um, and different institutes and different branches and portfolio program managers had different views on this. So um, at NIDA, we had a treatment development branch that dealt with development of new behavioral therapies. And although th that branch chief always considered those applications to be clinical trials. When I was branch chief of the clinical neuroscience branch and somebody put in a application, let's say to use TMS or to look at behavioral therapy on its effect on brain function. I took the position that the clinical neuroscience branch was by definition a basic science portfolio and therefore by definitions we did not support clinical trials. It should go somewhere else. For example, the treatment development branch if it's actually behavioral treatment. And we had the discretion to do that. That was then considered part of the problem. They wanted to have a, NIH Central wanted to have a more uniform way of dealing with these things including and especially behavioral treatments which were kind of in this gray area before. So definitely behavioral treatments and behavioral interventions. For funded grants, no, it does not apply retroactively until you put in a new application or a competing renewal that will be reviewed by study section. If I went back through the slide set, or if you pull the slide set down from the web, you will notice that on one slide it says what is clinical uh, uh, intervention. And it lists all the things that you talk about, but then finally there's, they've added a bullet about behavioral interventions to make it clear. So definitely now, moving forward, it's a clinical trial. You are right in the first place. Right. I always assumed it would qualify. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. How much time do we have? Are we done? You, you can keep going for half an hour. Oh, okay, good. Good, because I wanted to get to the application forms. Okay, any any other questions? Oh, yes. Last simple question. Go ahead. If, if a five-year proposal does not propose to do a clinical trial until year four, when does the clinical trial requirement kick in? At, at the time of that? That is called a delayed onset study. That is the formal name of it. Um, and the way that is registered in clinical trials, there's a specific way that that is handled in clinical trials because the assumption is it's a delayed onset study because the design of that study or some of the parameters of that study are dependent on results from earlier in the project. So you can't specify in clinicaltrials.gov what is going to go on. You can't put the protocol up there 
So you may not even be able to put your enrollment table up there because you don't know how many people you're going to actually have to enroll. So there is a mechanism to handle that. And it will still be considered a clinical trial. The application will be considered a clinical trial application. That, that, that caught me by surprise. Because if, if the science occurs in years one, two, and three... It's a mechanistic clinical trial. Or it, ha it starts out as a medical... As an, as an it may start out that way, but because there is a tri critical trial component, even though it's underspecified and delayed, the project as a whole is a clinical trial. Unless we come up with this um, hybrid designation, and it probably won't make any real difference at all, it'll just be the application and the FOA that you apply to. Yes? Talk to POs, um, try and get as much clarity as you can, use your best judgment, and be prepared for changes. And I don't know how far the leniency is going to extend in time, or in process, or anything. If you want if you want to provide feedback to the people who matter, um, Mike Lauer has a blog. It's called Open Mike. You can just Google it. And he has written a number of blogs on this topic. And there's a comment se section. And they do attend to the comments. He does attend to the comments. So you can go right now onto Open Mic and look at in the clinical trials, po a blog about the clinical trials policy, and see all the comments. Okay, moving on. Good. Okay, so the I've gone over a lot of this, of what's changing. Um, I want to focus now on the way that the FOAs are going to change and especially the new application forms. So we mentioned good clinical practice training requirement. That is in effect now for any application that was um, after January of this year. So y that's one thing. And these are the expectations for training, a class, a course. I, like was mentioned, you, UCLA most certainly has this already. It now simply applies to a broader range of studies. And you have to do it every three years and so on and submit the certificates as part of the application or GI, just in time information. Okay, so the forms and the nature of the application of the um, funding announcements are going to change after January 25th. So there will be a new form set. And sometime in the next couple weeks, late September, early October, you will be able to see the new form. You will be able to download the new forms. But there's already a video tutorial on the NIH website about the new forms. And I encourage you to look at it. So why are we going to have these no forms? So we, there will be less ambiguity about what is a clinical trial or what is not. It's not what's in the checkbox on the face page, which turns out to be, if, from my side as a program officer, it's clunky for me to search all the funded applications and pull out those that are classified as clinical trials. It was, it was non-intuitive. It took me about an hour to find the right field, which wasn't listed in an obvious place in, in within our database structure. Um, so there's uniform trial, clinical trial specific review criteria. 
if you, you can no longer add a clinical trial to a non-clinical trial application, you would have to submit a competitive renewal. Now again, this may change depending on how we handle hybrid applications. So just that caveat, this is subject to change and is fluid. Okay, so how do you know if it, the, app, the funding announcement accepts clinical trials? It'll say so in the title. I'm gonna be really straightforward. We're not trying to hide anything here. And it'll say so in um, the application types allowed. It'll say required, only accepting applications that are clinical trials, only accepting cl applications that are not clinical trials. Let me make a um, side comment that since we are reissuing all the program announcements, and any of you who have ever looked for program announcements know that there are hundreds or thousands of program announcements. There's an effort to streamline and reduce the number of program announcements that are topic specific and have institutes have um, state areas of interest on their website and then have applicants use the generic parent um, NIH-wide FOAs to apply to those. Now, we'll still have requests for uh, applications that will have um, specific reviews and specific um, funding announcements, but I just want to alert you that there is this trend. It's still being discussed how well and in what matter it's going to be implemented. Again, fluid. But don't be surprised that you go to your an institute's website and instead of seeing you know 42 active program announcements now you see three okay the reason we're doing that is it takes a long time to get a program in this announcement issued to the public because it has to go through approvals and review by um, the extramural staff takes a couple of months. Sometimes revisions have to be made. And so it goes back and forth for a long time. Now, institutes can be very nimble. And they can state their priority areas and areas of interest or hot emerging areas and just put it up on their website the next day. So this is a major change to our internal procedures it probably will not affect U.S. investigators so much, except when you say, well, w is this institute going to be interested in my proposal? Now you'll look at the institute's website rather than searching for a program announcement. And it turns out about 50% of all investigator-initiated applications come in through the NIH central um, parent generic program announcement, let's say for R01s. About 50%. So a lot of times your grant, grants offices will just put in the generic R01 program announcement. There's a form, there's a field on your form. And so you may say, I don't know what program announcement I'm responding to, I don't care. I just want it to go to this institute. And they'll just put in the generic one. So it's really not that big of a change, doesn't impact you very much, but I wanted to let you know about that. Okay, so again, we're gonna have clinical trial specific um, funding announcements. There we go. Okay, training awards. Institutional training awards, T awards, T32s, and fellowship awards will not be considered classified as clinical trials, even if the research plan involves what is clearly a clinical trial. The reason is that there's no research money in these awards. And so the person receiving these awards is 
is not funding a clinical trial. It's being, the funding for a clinical trial is under some other auspices. It might be another NIH grant, it might be from a pharmaceutical firm, it might be from a private foundation. So training awards will not have, will not be um, subject to the clinical trials policy. All training awards will not be considered clinical trials except for career development awards, K awards. And under those cases, it may or may not be a clinical trial based on the criteria. And the reason is there is research money on a K award. So you could be conducting a clinical trial under the auspices of your mentor that is funded by your mentor, in which case your K award would not be a cl clinical trial. Your mentor may not have be conducting a clinical trial, but whatever you're doing as an addition to that project might meet the criteria for a clinical trial, in which case the K award would be a clinical trial. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Yes? No? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, well, actually, it, it, it wouldn't have been a clinical trial with all of the bells and whistles of an old clinical trial. So in the K award application, I mean, if I was going to have somebody who was trying to learn how to do fMRI and TMS and do a clinical study, I wouldn't include that it's a clinical trial and they have to get like um, the kind of training that you would get in clinical pharmacology to evaluate the efficacy of a clinical trial. Do we now need to think in terms of really talking about clinical pharmacology training or clinical trials? So let's separate the science out from the regulation. Thanks. So um, let's say you're doing a study of working memory with fMRI, not a clinical trial by the case studies. Right? And now you have a postdoc that is interested in doing TMS. Okay, the postdoctoral award, the F application, would not be considered a clinical trial. Your study, your parent, the parent, let's say you have an R01 to do the working memory task. That study was not, would not have been submitted as a clinical trial and would not be um, required to have a clinical trial component um, until you came up for your competitive renewal. So you're in the second or third year of the application. It wouldn't be reclassified, my understanding. That's the regulatory part of it. Now, let's say you had a K awardee, and they're going to add TMS to your study. Their application would be considered a clinical trial the, because the research component meets the intervention criteria. So they would classify their K award as a clinical trial. Beyond that, there may be a gray area. But certainly, if they are engaging in something that meets the criteria of a clinical trial, even though the regulatory situate context is such that you don't have to register it on clinicaltrials.gov, it's still a good idea for that person to get training in clinical trials. Clinical trial design, for example, they might want to take a didactic course on that. You know, if it involves a drug, they may want to take it, you know, it would be look good on the application and to the reviewers that they're getting training in clinical pharmacology if that's what their training goals are. 
to do clinical trials with drugs. So even though it may not be required, it's a good idea. It strengthens the science of the application. Is that distinction clear? Okay. Okay, so here's the thing I, I mentioned about clinical trials optional. Um, I'm sorry, I keep getting mixed up which way I'm going. <laughs> okay, so the review criteria. So this is the, associated with the slides I had to take out. The standard review criteria remain significance investigator innovation approach, and there will be additional review criteria for studies classified as clinical trials, mainly around the timeline of the study and milestones. Again, the purpose here is to allow better, more precise, more explicit oversight and stewardship of the clinical trial so that program officers or other NIH staff will have an explicit statement to refer to of what the enrollment is expected to be at a certain point, what results may come out after a certain point. Okay? I can't give you what the review criteria are specifically because they're in flux, but the drafts that I've seen say things like, for a efficacy clinical trial, pay attention to issues of safety and treat, you know, disease outcome and disease progression. For a mechanistic clinical trial, what is the scientific impact and advances that this trial will provide? So they're trying to instruct reviewers that even though it's called a clinical trial, we're still, you know, it's to be evaluated as a mechanistic basic research study, but it happens to fall under the definition of clinical trial. Okay? Okay, so this is one of the new parts of the form. Pardon? Can I just ask you a quick question on the last topic? Yes. Um, will there be specific uh, clinical, non clinical, parent, or one, or three? Yes, yes. That's what I meant. In the title, it will say clinical trials only, no clinical trials allowed, and maybe there will be some that say mixed clinical trials. Or they may decide that if there is a component that is a clinical trial, then the entire application gets classified as a clinical trial for classification purposes. Because we're the government and we have to throw things into p pigeonholes. Okay, so the primary um, change to the application form is that it consolidates various sections, human subjects, inclusion, enrollment, and clinical trial information into one form. And this is, I, I know you can't read it, I wish I could zoom in on this, um, but I can't. It, a couple points about this. It, will collect information at the study level. So down here, you will list every study separately. That is part of the clinical trial. So there may be three studies in your project. You may be using three different drugs. You may be using three different populations or something. You get to describe it here in this form and um, provide a um, short descriptor. These fields will transfer to clinicaltrials.gov. That is the intention. That you're providing information that matches the, inform the fields on clinicaltrials.gov and so it can be tr the information can be populated just like your um, inclusion reports now are populated on our internal databases out of your application. We used to have to do this manually. So this is an attempt to make things more efficient and easier. There are two sections here that are very important. It used to be that you would put your clinical trial protocol, all the details of the protocol would go into the appendix. That is no longer going to be the case. Appendices will not be allowed you will put your protocol in this field. 
or attach doc, you upload a document. It's, it's a field up here, and it, it, you can't read it, but it says, you know, protocol goes here, essentially. What is nice about this, there is no page limit restriction. Same thing for your human subjects information. It will go into, I believe, this field. No page limit. Of course, there's no page limit now for human subjects information. So, this is a good thing. For those of you who are already doing clinical trials, this is going to make your life easier. It will make life easier for the reviewers because they'll know where to look for details of the clinical trial protocol if they are concerned that the research section um, is too cursory. So, this new form collects information previously that was included in the research strategy section. It, ser it means that you have more room. Those things that are clinical trials will have more room for their research strategy section because it's not taken up by a detailed description of the protocol. So take a look at the forms early so, you're used, so you get used to knowing what the structure of the form is, what kind of information goes into these new fields. So again, know the append, what information that used to go into an appendice now goes into these forms. And the appendix will, if your application puts the information into an appendix, the application will be sent back without review. There will, th this is one area where there will not be leniency. After January 25th. Not for the fall receipt dates, but for the winter receipt dates. Is that clear? So the key dates, um, whether we'll hit the September 25th deadline, we'll know next week. Um, October, you'll get, be able to download the formal packages. The instructions will be in September, maybe early October. The packages, the actual forms available in October, maybe early November. And then January 25th is the first due date for the new forms, and that's an AIDS receipt date. January 25th. Okay, any questions about that? Nope. Okay. Um, so, there is a video walkthrough on the NIH website that takes you through these new forms. I encourage you to look at them at your earliest convenience. Um, the single IRB pro, um, pro requirement is also for applications on after January 25th, not for this fall. Um, I'm not going to go through the single IRB um, protocol, but again, this is an attempt to make things easier for multi-site, um, easier for multi-site clinical trials. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through the details of this. This is all up on the clinical trials website. Um, dissemination. So part of clinicaltrials.gov is that you have to post your summary results. It now will apply to everything that is classified as a clinical trial, whether it's a mechanistic study, a pilot stu study, feasibility study, phase one, phase two, phase zero, doesn't matter. It all, all the results have to go up on clinicaltrials.gov. That's another reason for the policy because people were not posting their results. And so now it's going to be required and it's going to be looked at. And failure to post your results within the required time frame opens you to the liability of not being funded by NIH again. If you violate this, you're going to be in big trouble and big brother will be watching, or big sister will be watching, or mom will be watching, I don't know. Um, so, what is the dissemination requirement? 
21 days after enrolling the first subject. You have to register on clinicaltrials.gov. The registration has to be complete. And the summary information one year after the primary completion date. That's the completion of the clinical trial, not necessarily the completion of the funded application. Because you will be listing different studies, all the studies that compose the funded application, one study may get finished earlier than another. It's not a year after the grant expires, it's a year after the study is completed. Okay, so that, that is an, a more stringent and more explicit requirement. Yes? Is the study completion date the, the day you enroll your final subject? Because often the analysis could take even longer than you. My understanding, and again, this is only my understanding, and different institutes may have the leeway or may not have the leeway to come up with their own definition of what represents completion. My understanding, it's when the last subject's data is acquired. So you have a year to put up the summary results. And honestly, it's in your best interest to have a publication out within a year anyway. So. Okay, so more information, decision trees, case studies, FAQs, found up on the NIH website for clinical trials. They, this slide set, except for the case studies, this entire slide set is right there on the um, NIH website. So you can, do, you can pull it down and use it for internal training. There's videos, there's other types of materials, and help spread the word, so my job is done, okay? And I'll entertain any more questions or individual questions, um, but that's the end of my presentation. So thank you for your attention and the really excellent questions. Yes? Single IRB. Yes. I've been spending months working on a multi-site international study. I've been on IRB issues for decades, and I'm still learning how different institutions behave on a given clinical trial study. Yes. In this country, not to mention yes. going, going international. Yes. That's going to make a huge impact on my life. Yes. I don't know if it applies to anybody yes. else. Maybe we should do this all. Yeah, time. so one, one, the intention here is to get more uniformity and less idiosyncrasy for the same study. Uh, that would be terrific. That would be terrific. That being said, the ABCD study mandated a single IRB. But there are still some institutions, major institutions, that will not accept a, a single IRB. How they will deal with this policy, I don't know. Oh. <coughs> yes? I wonder about that too. I don't know and I've not been instructed. This is an NIH, at this point, this is an NIH policy. It's not even a Health and Human Services policy, so it may not apply to grants from, for example, SAMHSA. Right. So the So clinicaltrials.gov in part was initiated for the FDA and managed by NIH. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is dry. And Because I find it very frustrating myself when I go and I see 
see all of these clinical trials. I'm looking to see what's being done. And like you say, more than half don't show results, right? And we yes. don't know what happens to the study. So I'm just wondering if, if anybody's doing any... There may be a movement to do that. I don't know. There may be pushback from that. Um, but like I said, the clinicaltrials.gov was initially instituted because of concerns related to FDA applications from pharmaceutical companies. The, require, the legal requirement is that they submit two clinical trials to support their new drug application. And it came to light, and you may remember this from a number of years ago, that pharmaceutical companies may have conducted 10 clinical trials, only two of which came out positive. And their legal requirement was only to report the positive trials in support of their application. And they could file drawer the rest. And as that awareness came to light, awareness of this came to light, people said, well, that's not right. We need to find out. We need to find out about the clinical trials that failed. So clinicaltrials.gov was instituted to capture that kind of information. And now it's broadening out. Thank you. Yes. Um, I want to go back to the single IRB. Um, <clears throat> so if it's, if it's a requirement, is there going to be a specific area or form that, or are you going to require like letters and IRB reliance from multi-sites? Like how, how is that going to be implemented in, in the application process? You will state what the, who the single, I, the, the IRB that has primary responsibility is, where that is located, which site it's located, and there, it might be sufficient to do that, because the fact that you are submitting an application through your institution is a tacit acknowledgement that they will abide by the single IRB policy that your institution will do that. There's other information that you have to provide about that single IRB, um, which I don't recall off the top of my head, but it's on the website. Any other questions? I think we're good. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you for your attention. And feel free to contact me and if I'm not the right person to answer your question, I'll try and get you to the right person. My email is sgrant at, at nida.nih.gov. And like I say, you know, you may want to submit to the Aging Institute. And I'll say, well, maybe you should call somebody else over there. Or I don't know anybody over there. Just look at their website. But I might be able to answer a general, a generic policy question. One more time. S. Grant. S. Grant at NIDA, NIDA.NIH.GOV.